fourth potential risk in the global economy is what's happening in emerging markets. There has been a slowdown of growth, not just in China, but also in Russia, in Brazil, in uh, Turkey, in India. Some of it is cyclical. There is a recession in the Eurozone, recession in the UK, slow growth in US and Japan. Therefore, to trade links, that leads to slower growth for these emerging markets. However, I pointed out that high growth of po uh, potentially of emerging market, that's conditional on continuing market-oriented reform and structural reform. And in the last few years, in a number of emerging markets, there has been a movement away from market-oriented reform. They've been moving instead in the direction of what people refer to as state capitalism. More role of state-owned enterprises in the economy, uh, more role of state-owned bank, resource nationalism, protectionism, industrial policy, national champions. That might be legitimate during a crisis, but in order to have sustained economic growth, you have to move away from state capitalism, from having too much state-owned enterprises running the economy, like in China, like in uh, Russia, like even in India and Brazil, and having more private sector development to maintain high economic growth. So the question is, are they going to go back to market-oriented reform? Fifth and final risk about the global economy. As I said, I'm an economist, I'm not a geopolitical expert, but there is a geopolitical risk right now, many of them. There could be a military confrontation next year between Israel and Iran on the issue of nuclear proliferation. If that were to lead to war, they could have a spike in oil prices and there will be a major shock for the world economy. After all, uh, the Yom Kippur War of 73 led to a global recession. Uh, the Iranian Revolution of 79 and the spike of oil that followed it led to a global recession. Even the 1990 recession was caused by the spike in oil prices caused by the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. So, Shocks in the Middle East can lead to spike in oil prices. We all depend still on oil and energy. That can be a negative. And of course, there is this arc of instability in the Middle East. We still, uh, revolution started in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya. They're still fragile. You have a civil war in Syria. Uh, you have a civil war in Yemen. You have restless uh, Shiite communities and minorities from Bahrain to Kuwait, to Saudi Arabia, uh, to Lebanon. U.S. left uh, Iraq and now Kurds, Shia, and Sunni are starting to kill each other. There is the Iran issue. And let's not go to places that are unstable like Pakistan or Afghanistan. So there is an arc of potential geopolitical instability that goes from Algeria or Morocco in minor form all the way to Pakistan and Afghanistan. So we have to deal with this issue. And we have to provide the opportunity for this country to have growth, jobs, investment, stability, so that they're going to return to social and political stability. There is a major role that Europe can play in stabilizing economically and financially uh, the Middle East. All these countries need huge investments in infrastructure, in education, in human capital, in housing, in uh, real estate. There is lots of work has to be done to build the Middle East and make it stable. And many people in this, uh, in this room can contribute to that as well. So these are sources of instability. So I'll conclude with the following observation. Uh, many of the things that are positive about the global economy have to do with the longer term. Rise of emerging market, globalization, technological change. And many of the negative and the downside risks have to do with the short run. Risk of a Eurozone crisis, a uh, cliff in the U.S., hard landing of China, Middle East conflict. Uh, the famous uh, economist John Maynard Keynes said, we should not care about the long run, because in the long run we're all dead. But the paradox of the global economy today is that if we can reach that long run, it's a long run in which our life is going to change radically because of technology, globalization, and the rise of emerging markets. And it's going to change in a radical way and a positive way, because all these digital revolution, all these IT technologies, all this globalization, all these new products and services and integration are going to really improve materially the welfare of people in advanced economies and emerging markets. The world could be a better world in the long run if we can deal with all these things. The problem is not that we risk to be dead in the long run. The problem is we have a small risk of being, unquote, dead in the short run. Because unless we resolve the Eurozone crisis, unless we fix the U.S. problem, unless we 
make the growth in China more stable, unless we avoid war and instability in the Middle East, there could be the risk of another economic and global financial crisis, and the next one, if it were to occur, would be worse than the, than the previous one. So the critical thing is sound policies. We need leaders in advanced economies and emerging markets who can look beyond the election, beyond their short-term political interests of their own lobbies and interest group, and do what's important to saving their own country and cooperate internationally because we live in this crowded planet in which we have to coordinate our economic policies. So we need, first of all, policy leaders who have that strength, and we also need, and we have in advanced economies and emerging market, business leaders, people who think about making production decisions, about innovating, about increasing productivity, about investing into their own people and their workers in terms of globalizing, in terms of integrating their activity globally so that we become a more integrated world and a more integrated world where everybody's growing, everybody's a success, and that's the condition for peace and stability. If we want to have peace and build the peace, we have also to build the infrastructures and the human capital and the physical capital and the jobs that lead us to then social and political stability and peace in the world. So the two things go together. The business world and the policy world is essential to maintaining and restoring global peace that is something we all need. So we are all together in this integrated global economy. No country is an island, everybody is integrated and we are we're either swim together or we sing together. So we have to cooperate on all of these major things. And I think that we have leaders in the business world, in the intellectual world, in the political world around the world who can take this challenge. And that's a, it's a great pleasure being today in a firm like this one that is also one of these business leaders in Italy and in Europe and around the world as well. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Rubini. Just to, to thank you. Thank you. Velocemente due domande, una ha già risposto durante la conferenza e quindi evito di fare riguardava l'Europa. Eh, la prima è molto diretta, nello stato attuale delle cose, con il grande punto interrogativo che l'Italia ha in primavera per il suo futuro, per il suo futuro governo, comprerebbe un titolo di Stato italiano? Um, I would say the following thing about Italy, I think that overall uh, things are improving in Italy in the last few months. Uh, the spreads on Italian bonds, uh, now they are much lower than they were a few months ago. Uh, they've fallen, first of all, because uh, this government and the political forces are supporting it. They've realized that Italy has to do austerity, painful austerity of raising revenues, cutting spending, making the long-term reforms are going to make the country more productive. It's painful in the short run, it leads to less economic activity, but it makes a viability and the sustainability of the fiscal policy of Italy more sustainable. Secondly, now the expectation that the European Central Bank may, under some condition, buy the bonds of Italy and Spain has already led to reduction in those yields, even before a single penny has been spent by the European Central Bank to buy those bonds. So I think uh, that's going to be also a positive, and uh, the results in the markets are showing it. You know, Italy is a democracy, it's going to go to elections, and as a democracy, people are going to choose freely who are the political parties that they want them to run. I think that Italy, like many other parts of the world, needs uh, a broad uh, social and political consensus on the difficult choices that need to be made. Even the U.S., to resolve our fiscal problem, Republicans and Democrats will have to sit together after the election, regardless of whether Obama is re-elected or Romney, and work together. Because if you don't work together, you're going to fight each other and not resolve. So what Italy needs to do is known. You need fiscal austerity, you need structural reform, you have to do the reforms that sustain return to economic growth and job growth, and it's going to take time. So. I would say that whatever happens in those Italian elections, continuation of policies and a national cohesion between different parties on the same path that is painful, that is going to take time and sacrifices, is unavoidable. As long as that commitment continues, then it's going to be bumpy, it's going to be difficult. Uh, Italy has a huge amount of challenges, including restoring potential growth. Per capita income growth has been flat for the last uh, decade. It can be done. 
but it takes a lot of leadership. Velocissimamente invece comprerebbe un bond emesso da un'azienda italiana fortemente orientata all'export e ben posizionata sui mercati emergenti? Yes, I think that, you know, uh, this firm is really a model uh, for what uh, Italian uh, corporate world and business world can do. Uh, it was a firm that, you know, only two or three years ago was uh, having most of its own uh, uh, clients only in Italy, up to 90% of it. And because of the realization uh, that uh, economic growth is going to be anemic, if not a contraction, has realized that to survive and thrive in this global economy, you have to open up, that you have to go abroad, you have to start to produce or export abroad. And that has been the successful diversification strategy for many Italian firms, whether you are a small uh, firm or a medium size or a large one, the ones that are now successful are those that have that orientation through foreign direct investment, through exports, to provision of goods and services uh, to the global markets. You know, even when Italy is going to go back to growth, growth in Italy is going to be modest, at best one, maybe two percent. So if you want to grow faster, you have to take advantage of the fact there is a world out there with country growing 6%, 8%, 10% are going to grow like that for the next 10, 20 years. They need human capital, they need technology, they need uh, services, they need lots of things that advanced economies firm can provide. So the, the only way to successfully survive and thrive is going to be to open up yourself internationally. Uh, there is of course a question if you are a very small firm, do you have the economies of scale to be able to then open up to a global market, but this example is of a medium-sized firm that has been quite successful in radically changing its orientation and now having over two-thirds of its own activity being international rather than domestic. I think this is an example of what many other firms in Italy and Europe will have to do over time.